Okay, everybody, we're going to get started today. We are doing the Cook Law Kentucky, and I'm getting ready to share my screen. And um, we'll get started. Mm. No, sorry. From the beginning. Okay. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about Cook Wild Kentucky and it is about um, duck. My name is Nanette Banks. I am the Letcher County Family and Consumer Sciences Agent here at the Extension Office. And there on the screen is my email address, our office phone number, and my cell phone number. So if you need to get in, talk, in, in touch with me, here is the contact information and we can send you whatever um, information you want from this um, video. So here's Cook Wild Kentucky, and we want to know what Cook Wild Kentucky is. Um, it is a partnership between the University of Kentucky Extension, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, Feeding Kentucky, Hunters for the Hungry, and the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. Um, current recipes that we have um, currently are venison, fish, frog legs, duck, and rabbit. And um, we have done a Cook Wild Kentucky on venison. We've done one on rabbit and then today is duck. And we have one more that we are going to do and it will be on frog legs and we'll have it scheduled for next month. Um, but we are planning to expand the recipes to elk, turkey, turtle, squirrel, raccoon, um, and beaver. And um, this is going to be in the future, but right now we haven't got it um, on there. Yeah, um, so there's places in Kentucky that are USDA approved meats that you can buy, uh, rabbit or venison, things like that if you don't hunt. There's the Good Foods Co-op in Lexington, Critchfield Meats in Lexington, Kroger, but when you go to Kroger, make sure that you um, call ahead. If you are going just for that, call ahead to see if they do have um, the wild game because they don't carry it on a regular basis all the time. Myers in Lexington, Walmart Supercenters, JS Rabbitry in Frankfurt, the Chop Shop in Wolf County, and then the United Grocery Outlet or the UGO in Hazard, but the same as Kroger. Make sure you call ahead of time to see if they do have it. So today, talking about duck and talking about how to prepare it and eat it. Duck is not considered white meat like you would consider chicken breast as white meat. The nutritional value of duck meat of a three ounce of domesticated roasted duck um, is closer to that of chicken thighs with a little higher iron content. You want to fully defrost the duck in the refrigerator for two to three days before cooking it. This allows the duck to stay at a safe temperature and it prevents any foodborne illnesses. Always cook any type of poultry, whether it's duck or chicken, at a minimum of 165 degrees. And that doesn't matter if it's farm raised or if it's a wild game. And always wash your hands properly with warm water and soap for at least 20 seconds. This is before you start cooking. And then if you change, um, like if you are wash your hands, handle the raw duck, you want to wash your hands afterwards before you start handling um, onions or carrots or anything like that. So make sure you wash your hands for 20 seconds with warm soapy water in between any um, changes of um, whether you go from raw meat to um, produce to if you have to go to the restroom to come back. So make sure you just keep your hands good and wash. Never wash or rinse any type of meat. Um, I know some people think that you should always rinse your chicken and poultry. This does not kill any or get rid of any bacteria, but it can contaminate your kitchen and your kitchen surfaces. So if you do put the um, duck or the chicken um, and rinse it in your sink, that's just putting all the contamination into your sink. And then you're gonna have to wash and sanitize your sink and then your countertops. But if you do want to get rid of the juice that's in the packaging, just get the meat and a paper towel, a clean paper towel, and pat your meat dry 
when taking it out of the package and that will dry up some of the juice that is left in there. Um, with a duck, you can cook the neck of a duck to make stock to use later on. Um, use a rack when roasting duck so it will sit up off of the fat because I, we'll talk about here in a little bit, duck is a little fatty and um, the fat drippings will drip into the pan. So if you have the duck sitting higher um, on a rack and that fat drips off to the bottom. And then a basic roasting does really well uh, with duck and you can just add some seasonal vegetables. And that's what we did today. It's called duck and potatoes. So it's just a roasting is all it is. So this is the recipe and it's called duck and potatoes. And you'll see the picture here is a whole duck. When I went to Critchfield Meats to buy the meat, um, it was not a whole duck, I ended up with duck breast. So my recipe looks a little different th than this one because it's just a duck breast. But here are the ingredients, one wild duck that's been cleaned, one unpeeled apple cut in half, but make sure with any produce, uh, fruits or vegetables that you wash before you put it into the food. So I washed the apple, I cut it in half, and then I did cut out the core. I didn't want the core in it. Um, then three to four cups of water, an eighth a teaspoon of salt, an eighth a teaspoon of pepper, four large potatoes that have been peeled and diced and make sure you wash them, three carrots that have been peeled and sliced and make sure you wash them, one large onion that's been diced, but before you dice it, make sure you wash it, and then two teaspoons of ground sage. So the directions, you wanna take the whole duck and apple, put it in a five quart kettle with three to four cups of water, cover it, bring it to a boil and let it boil for 30 minutes. Then take it off the heat, put the duck in a 15 by 10 baking dish, and then use two cups of the reserved liquid from the boiled duck and put it into the um, baking dish. Season that with your salt and pepper, and then you wanna cover it with aluminum foil and put it back in the, uh, put it in the oven at 350 degrees for 45 minutes. After the 45 minutes is over with, bring it out of the oven, take the foil off, and then add your diced potatoes, sliced carrots, diced onion, and your sage, and then put it into, um, put it into the oven again, bake it for 45 minutes to one hour or longer um, until your duck and potatoes are tender. But remember to make sure the internal temperature of the duck is 165 degrees at the leg joint. And then make sure you keep an eye on the duck and potatoes to make sure that uh, you don't run out of the liquid. Um, because if it does um, dry up, you want to add a little bit of reserve liquid back in there. And it does tell you here in the notes to reduce fat content. You can remove the skin and visible fat before cooking. And this helps reduce the wild flavor um, taste in the duck. This does serve six um, people and it will give you a three ounce meat serving, one potato serving, and a half a cup of vegetable serving. So now um, I'm going to, the nutrition facts is 600 calories for one serving, 29 total grams of fat for one serving, 10 grams of saturated fat, zero grams of trans fat, 150 milligrams of cholesterol, 190 milligrams of sodium, 46 grams of carbohydrates, six grams of fiber, seven grams of sugar, 38 grams of protein, and then it does provide 0% daily value of vitamin D. It does provide 4% of your daily value of calcium, 60% daily value of iron, and then 30% potassium. Um, so now I'm going to share another screen um, and show you how we do the duck. Okay, does everybody see that now? Okay, so I've already um, cooked the duck and apple and I have already um, put it in the oven um, and baked it for another 45 minutes and this is what it looks like. So, and I've already put the salt and pepper on it. So now what we're going to do, we are going to add, and you can see this is the three carrots. So I'm gonna put those in there. This is one large onion. And as you can see, this is one large onion that's already been just roughly chopped. It's like a big dice is what it is. And then I have 
And you can see I'm gonna pour the water. I'm not gonna pour the water off on this because we need a little more water. But to keep the potatoes from turning brown, I put water, put them in water when I diced them up. But we're gonna keep the, put the water back in there. So now what we're gonna do, this is the two tables, two teaspoons of ground sage. I'm going to sprinkle that over top and then put it back in the oven for 45 minutes to an hour. Let that bake, and then because we are on TV or on video, I can show you what the prepared dish looks like afterwards. This is the duck, and I want to show you. You see the fat on here? That is just fat. That's not the meat. That's the meat. This is the fat. So we can just remove that and don't have to eat that. So I'm gonna do that on all pieces um, to where we don't have the fat on here and you don't get a piece of that fatty um, taste. But this right here is what it looks like. It's just really just potatoes, carrots, onions, and meat. So now I am going to stop sharing this screen and go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we've already talked about that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about different kinds of duck for eating. Um, you have the mallard, which is the green, um, the one with the green head. It's a smaller type duck. It is a little greasier than other ducks and it is farm raised on a limited basis. Then you have the one with the red beak here that's called a Muscovy duck. It's larger and it's often used um, for their breast or their liver. And then at the bottom, just the white one with the orange um, beak, it's called a white pecking duck and it is more mild, has more tender meat and it does taste less gamey. Now, when we're talking about ducks, there's a broiler duckling or a fryer duckling. And what this means, it's a young duck that's under eight weeks old. It does have tender meat. And ducklings classified as broiler fryers, they weigh anywhere between three and six and a half pounds. Then you have a roaster duckling. It's a young duck also, but it's under 16 weeks old that has tender meat and weighs a little more. It's four to seven and a half pounds. And then you have a mature duck, which is over six months old. It does have some toughened flesh and usually they're too old to lay eggs and their meat is used in processed products, not just to eat like what we were with the duck and potatoes. Now, almost all ducks are raised indoors to protect from predators. These are the ones that you're gonna buy in the stores. Now you can go hunting, which Shad's gonna talk about that here in a little bit and get your own duck, wild duck from um, hunting. But the ones I'm talking about that are raised indoors are the ones that are sold to stores. Um, most ducks are now raised in the states of Wisconsin and Indiana. They're fed corn and soybeans, fortified with vitamins and minerals, and most feed contains no animal byproducts. All ducks that are farm raised have to be federally inspected. Their grading is voluntary though, and the plant has to pay to have their ducks graded. And when they're talking about grading, the USDA grade A ducklings are the highest quality available. They are plump, meaty, and have a skin free from cuts, bruises, and tears. And then usually the grade B and C ducklings are not found in supermarkets. You normally just find the grade A ducklings. Um, no, no hormones are allowed in U.S. duck production. Um, the Food and Drug Administration strictly prohibits the use of hormones in ducks. Very few drugs have been approved for ducks, so antibiotics are not routinely given. And, and if a duck drug is given, it's usually through the feed. And they do have to have a withdrawal period of days required from the time it is administered until it is legal to slaughter the bird. So the residues can exit the bird system. So you don't have the drug in the bird when it is um, slaughtered. Additives are not allowed on fresh duck. If the meat or giblets are processed, any additives such as MSG, salt, or sodium ethrobate must be list listed on the label. 
Now we've talked about the little fat on the duck. Ducks, they swim. So they have a fat layer beneath the skin that keeps them able to float. Uh, before cooking a whole bird, the skin should be pricked all over with a fork to enable the fat to render out. And I did do that. I went into um, the duck, pricked it with a fork all over, um, and it let a lot of the fat come out. Um, but the fat layer on the underneath part of the duck must have melted and disappeared for the bird to be done. And we did have a little bit left on there, but I did not remove any of that. The fat is not marbled into the meat, so it can easily be removed from the surface of a raw duck if you are deboning the meat before cooking, which this was duck breast, not um, one that had bones in it. Um, so retail cuts a duck, a whole duckling includes giblets and neck, bone in parts such as whole legs, breast quarter and breast. You have boneless breast, skin on or skinless, and this one was skinless. Giblets, which include the liver, heart, and gizzard, sold with the whole birds. Then tongues and feet, it's a delicacy most exported to Hong Kong, but some used by Asian Americans. Processed products such as smoked cooked breast, sausage, and hot dogs. And then sun cuts may be used mainly for food service and restaurants. So when you are thinking about cooking duck for um, your family, you wanna allow one to one and a half pounds of raw weight per person. Raw boneless meat yields about three servings per pound after cooking. And you wanna estimate three to four ounces per person for fully cooked products. And because all duck meat is dark, it has a stronger flavor than chicken breast meat and even chicken leg meat. Um, you can marinate duck in the refrigerator for up to two days, but you wanna make sure you boil the used marinade before brushing it on the cooked poultry and then discard any uncooked leftover marinade. Because the demand is not as high as for other poultry, duck is usually kept in the frozen food cases at grocery stores and what I bought was um, frozen. It may be more readily available at holiday times because a lot of people will have like duck um, for dinners at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Select duck just before checking out at the register place a duck, the raw duck in a disposable plastic bag. That helps keep the leakage um, in the bag and it keeps it from cross-contaminating um, other foods. Make the grocery your last stop before going home. And then when you get home, make sure you refrigerate immediately and use within one to two days or freeze it in its original packaging. And then when you're picking up a fully cooked duck, be sure it's hot when you pick it up. You don't want a lukewarm duck you want to make sure it's hot and then use it within two hours or cut it into several pieces and refrigerate in shallow covered containers. And you can eat it either cold or reheated to 165 degrees Fahrenheit and it is safe to freeze ready prepared duck. So now Shad um, is going to come on and talk to you about how to hunt um, duck. Okay. Um, I'm Shad Baker and I'm the Electric County ANR agent. That's Ag and Natural Resources. And I've not been a big duck hunter, but I have been a, a big hunter in general. So I don't expect that I'm like uh, Elmer Fudd or anything. I'm not a, an expert uh, daffy duck hunter or anything like that. But uh, I'll do the best that I can. Nanette, you can take it forward a slide. So the dates that we have, the upcoming dates for this year have not yet been set, but they generally uh, would be about this same time of the year. So if you want to go duck hunting, uh, usually it's that last uh, little stretch of November and in uh, through the, the, after the first week of December, and that's basically to wait until that, uh, like there's another season that comes in. Uh, but they, you can hunt from uh, the, after the end of the first week of December through the end of January. So this is a winter time um, sport and you want to be sure to, to dress uh, warmly. Uh, most duck hunters have uh, Gore-Tex or some kind of waterproof and uh, really thick clothing because it can get really cold uh, while you're sitting in a blind uh, waiting on the ducks. Next. So the main uh, ducks that you'll be looking for, uh, they're, they're in the, the large category of puddle ducks, and that includes mallards, which are real common around here. This is what you'd see on the Kentucky River. They've got the green head. 
the wood duck, which to me is the prettiest uh, bird in North America. It's uh, beautiful. The, the male in particular has got a beautiful uh, coloration on it. But the American black duck and uh, northern pintail and uh, American uh, widgeon and gadwell and, and there's uh, cinnamon tails and shovelers and uh, several different kinds. Uh, then there's some divers and that would be your canvas back and uh, redhead and bufflehead and golden eye and uh, mergansers, that kind of thing. Um, but these, uh, these typically uh, like to be on, um, I guess, bigger, larger bodies of water. Uh, this isn't something that you would typically see on uh, any of the rivers that we have around here. They like, they like big water. Okay, and then others uh, would be your sea ducks, and uh, these obviously like salt water. Uh, these would be along the coast, and so I won't talk a lot about them, but then we also have whistling ducks, and uh, again, these aren't uh, common around here, but they're, they're just different uh, types of duck. So as far as where to duck hunt, your puddle ducks are going to like shallow water. Uh, that's where they feed. Uh, you'll see them bobbing down and feeding off the bottom usually and, and bobbing back up. Uh, they flock to marshes and swamps and lake shores and uh, river backwaters. Um, sometimes it's fields that have been flooded. Uh, just anything that's got shallow uh, water in it. They're, they're feeding a lot on the vegetation uh, or things that are along the bottom uh, of the water. As far as your divers, these are uh, the ones I said like the bigger water. So to find them, you have to go to larger lakes or some really big rivers, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they're real common up on the Great Lakes and, and along some of the shorelines of the, the coast. Uh, ducks uh, inhabit a lot of different areas, and so uh, sometimes it can be hard to locate them. Don't think that just because you're on a, a river or a lake that you're going to see them. Uh, they kind of uh, come and go, and so you only uh, need uh, observational skills and a willingness to work. Uh, so uh, it may mean you need to move around from one spot to the next until you locate the birds. And uh, don't ask friends where they duck hunt uh, because you're better off breaking off from the crowds and finding your own. Uh, you don't want to go crowd somebody else. Uh, as far as the diving ducks, any place that you've got a good view of a lake uh, where you can use binoculars or something to, to look across the water for them, uh, that, that would be a good thing. Uh, those puddle ducks, uh, they like feeding areas. Uh, like places where there's fields of corn or beans, soybeans, uh, oats, wheat, barley, that kind of thing, because they, they will go into those to feed. And they usually hit the fields at the first slide and then again, right before dark. Uh, and those fields attract geese and the geese usually attract the ducks. And uh, that's the way that works. So they like similar food and similar habitat, uh, but the, the geese are a little more brazen than the ducks. The ducks are kind of skittish. Uh, you need to keep an open mind. Ducks are wherever you find them. So uh, don't think that you're going to outthink the duck. Uh, the duck's going to do what the duck wants to do, and it's up to you to find where that is. So after a while, you're, you're going to kind of get the feel for where, what kind of places like, uh, the, or what kind of places attract the, the birds and uh, during different weather conditions. And uh, weather has a, a large role in, um, with the ducks. Uh, some things, some places they would prefer to be on sunny days and other places it would be on gloomy rainy days. And uh, if you're hunting, uh, I know a lot of times if it's a clear day and they're migrating uh, from up north, they tend to fly really high on sunny days. And on cloudy overcast days, that's when they will tend to be lower. And that's also when it's a little easier to get them to come down uh, to, to decoys and things. So uh, again, ducks are usually most active early in the morning and late in the evening. And Kentucky law says that you're legal a half hour before sunrise and a half hour after sunset. And uh, so uh, no, no shooting before that or after that. 
and they are especially active during cold or windy days or when the, the weather is going to change. And if you ever watch songbirds or anything, uh, any kind of wildlife, you'll notice they can pick up on when the weather is going to change and they start to feed a lot more. And so that's exactly what these ducks are doing. And so if you know that there's going to be cold, rainy weather coming in, uh, that would be a good time to, to go duck hunting. Uh, they're not as active uh, if it gets really warm like it is today. Uh, these are days that they will be kind of sluggish. They're just trying to stay cool and not get too overheated. Uh, they don't fly well when the wind is light. Uh, and uh, so uh, as they feed, rest, and loaf, uh, it's mostly uh, on calm uh, water. Uh, so they don't like to be out in choppy water and that kind of thing. So you want to hunt early, late. If the wind blows, the barometer falls, and the birds continue to fly throughout the day. If, if they do continue to fly throughout the day, just stay at it. And uh, many diving ducks seem to fly best during the mid-morning, so they wait on it to warm up just a little bit. And you have to be out there if you're going to take advantage of that. So some things that you might need for duck hunting is decoys. Uh, and that's basically like a, a plastic fake uh, duck. And uh, when they look down, when they're flying over and they see those, they think, oh, there must be something good down there. And so uh, that's the kind of thing that might attract them in. But a lot of uh, birds have become suspicious of decoys. And so if you're in a place that gets hunted a lot, uh, they might uh, not be easily fooled. And so you have to do a really good job with how you set your decoys up to try to make it as realistic as possible. Uh, calls are something that you will need and that's kind of a mouth call that you call to them and they think it's another duck. Um, and uh, again, there's skills that go into that. You can't just blow on a call and think that it's just automatically gonna bring a duck in. Uh, you have to learn how to use it and when to use it and how loud to be. And uh, it takes a lot of time to get good at this. Uh, blinds are a necessity. They've got good eyesight. And if they see you down there or if you move at all, uh, they will not come down and they will stay up too high for you to shoot. So uh, you need a good blind, a place to hide. And uh, chest waders or hip boots, because a lot of times you'll be in wet places or when you shoot the duck, it may fall into the water and you need to be able to go out and retrieve the duck. Uh, waterproof gloves uh, for cold uh, winter hunts, and then camouflage clothing for cold winter hunts, and then of course guns and ammo, and uh, it takes um, uh, a good choke uh, to shoot at ducks because sometimes they'll be pretty high up, and the ammo is kind of site specific. Uh, some of the wildlife management areas where you might go duck hunting uh, they don't allow you to use lead shot. A lot of times you have to use steel shot or something else. So you just need to be sure what the regulations are where you're going to go. As far as the decoys, there's a lot of different manufacturers and they're not really expensive, uh, but uh, they've got some now that, you know, back in the olden days, they, they were fake and you could kind of tell they were fake. But the ones now, they've gotten really good at it and they paint them and they look like a real live duck. And um, those uh, modern fakes are kind of light and they ride well on the water and uh, uh, they don't break on the bank. So uh, those are all positive things. Um, the, they also have these full bodied standing ones and those cost more. Uh, good goose, wait, go back. Good goose and mallard models uh, kind of add to it. If all you use are duck, decoys, uh, they might get suspicious. So I know a lot of people will throw in some geese decoys in with their ducks because that makes it look more like it would in the wild. And some people even use like fake um, herons and, and things like that. Um, and it's all to just make the, the ducks think that it's the real deal. And you can spend extra money on the polyurethane or the burlap wrap models that uh, take a lot of punishment and uh, they won't sink. Um, there's some that will flap in the wind. Uh, they've got wings on them that will flap in the wind and it, it kind of makes the ducks uh, think that it's even more realistic. So it's whatever you want to spend money on. 
every decoy needs a line connected to a weight. You don't want these things blowing down the lake or down the river. You need to be able to get them back because they cost you money. So uh, for individually rigged decoys, you might want to use some nylon line with high tensile strength and um, uh, different types of line that tear line uh, last longer than uh, just a generic line but allow a lot of line for the area that you're hunting. It can take a lot of uh, line to secure all your decoys. Make sure that you leave some slack so that the decoy kind of moves around naturally in the wind. If they're all sitting uh, uh, immobile in one spot, it's pretty obvious that that's a fake. And so you want it to move a little bit so that it looks like live ducks that are kind of paddling around down there. And uh, you want to make sure that you allow more line than, than the depth of the water that you're going to hunt. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if the water is three feet deep, you don't want to use three feet of rope because it won't allow the, uh, the decoy to move. You need to allow it to be about six feet long so that as it moves, there, there's enough to let it move around. Decoy weights come in a lot of different styles. There's sinker type weights and mushroom anchors and cup shaped weights and grapple hook anchors. And um, any of those will work in small water. Um, <clears throat> if you get into larger water, it, it's gonna change things a little bit. There are some models that dig in. They've got scoops or grapple hooks and those secure the decoys better in sand or in larger uh, water situations. Um, as far as uh, multiple decoys, uh, sometimes you have a, a leader uh, 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 decoy line and it attaches to, uh, to another, uh, what they call a mother line. So you've got one big long line with several attached to that. And uh, that's just to kind of keep them in a cluster, at, which is more like what they would be in the wild. You don't just see ducks evenly spaced, they tend to cluster. And that's what you're trying to duplicate. Next. Uh, so as far as uh, jump shooting, uh, this is where you sneak up on the ducks and shoot them as they flush. And you can jump shoot ponds uh, on foot. Uh, you can do it wading through uh, creeks that kind of wind along. You can do it from a canoe or uh, something like that. And uh, this is, the, I guess, the most traditional, purest form of duck hunting. Uh, it's, it's a lot more interactive and and uh, exciting and, and there's more skill involved. And uh, uh, if you're doing it without a dog, you need to be careful not to drop birds in uh, that thick cover because it makes retrieving very difficult. So that's one of the benefits of having a dog is they'll go in and get it for you. Uh, but just make sure if you're doing this that you know where all the property boundaries are. You don't want to trespass on somebody else's land. And uh, just make sure that you respect other people's rights. As far as pass shooting, uh, this, this is a great tactic and it's uh, real ethical. The key is to um, limit your shots to uh, birds that are within range. So ideally it would, it's kind of like turkey hunting. You don't want anything more than 40 yards. And um, you're, uh, what you're doing here is you're sitting uh, stationary and you're letting the birds fly through where you're at. So you want to locate areas where the birds fly through, but they don't necessarily want to land. And you hide in that place and you wait. So it might be like a creek corridor or maybe a high spot between several different little pothole uh, prairie lakes. But uh, again, this is just a place that the birds are passing through and it's, it's like a funnel for them. And you just set up in the middle of the funnel. Um, the, the decoy game is the most traditional duck hunting method and it kind of imply, or, uh, combines the, the decoys uh, with a concealed setup that the ducks go through. It allows you to be mobile uh, as you can hunt from shorelines uh, while wading or in open water from a boat. You do need to uh, pay attention to the wind direction as the ducks tend to, to land and take off into the wind. And so that, that'll help you know which way they're gonna uh, take off. And uh, try to keep the sun at your back uh, rather than in your face because it can blind you and you won't be able to see to shoot as well. And you wanna set your decoys to mimic real ducks and you just hide within range. 
and try to position, position yourself to one side or the other of your spread of decoys uh, because you don't want those ducks looking directly at you as they approach. You want their attention to be on those decoys. And so this is just a tactic where you, you move with your decoys uh, from one place to another. And if you're hunting puddle ducks, uh, mallard decoys work in almost every situation. So you don't have to have the kind of duck that you're hunting. Uh, if they see any breed of duck down there, it'll work. Uh, during uh, teal seasons, uh, you'll want to use blue wing or uh, green wing decoys. Uh, and uh, if you're hunting the prairies, that's gonna be pintails or widgeons. Uh, and then if you're field hunting, using those uh, goose decoys works for all other types of puddle ducks. Uh, if it's diving ducks uh, that you're looking for, then blue bills or canvasback decoys work really well. And uh, you want to use uh, Whistler decoys if you're hunting those gold knives. So as far as the numbers of decoys to use, the size of your spread, which is what, what they refer to for your group of decoys, it's going to vary depending on where you are in the situation. If you're on a small pothole, a half dozen uh, will, will work. So six is enough. But um, Obviously, if you're in a big place, it's going to take more decoys if you're on big water. And uh, if you're in marshes or something like that, your, your spread uh, might uh, limit how many that you can take with you. And uh, so, um, again, more water, the bigger the water, the more the decoys you need to use. And uh, sometimes it can take up to six dozen decoys to attract ducks from a distance. So. Uh, you know, when people do this, they've usually got access to a boat and uh, they'll take a lot of decoys with them and set those things up and just be ready. And uh, for really big water diver hunts, it, it may mean 200 decoys. That's a lot of decoys. But large fields, um, a lot of times they'll use these uh, uh, honker decoys and it can bring in mallards or blacks to take a look. Uh, don't use so many decoys that your rig doesn't look normal though. Uh, you know, if they're not used to seeing a big group of ducks in that area and you've got a huge number of ducks out there, they're not stupid. Uh, they've got a brain and they've survived for a reason. So uh, you need to try to think like a duck uh, and you'll have better luck that way. As far as the shape and the pattern, there's several different patterns you can use for how to set up those decoys. And uh, the way you set it up uh, kind of affects how the ducks come into your setup uh, and where they'll try to land and whether they're going to feel comfortable committing to land, uh, which is called finishing. Um, puddle ducks, uh, they like to have uh, holes, uh, kind of openings between the decoys. So uh, they don't like to fly in to uh, fly in low over other ducks or decoys on approach. So you want to leave an opening uh, in your spread for them. Uh, so some common spreads include a loose group of a few decoys, uh, and that works well for, for streams or small ponds. Divers love to fly over their brethren when they approach, so uh, you don't have as much of a problem with them being in a cluster. Uh, they usually feature, uh, when you're hunting for divers, uh, they'll use a large group of decoys upwind and then a long uh, tail extending downwind like a runway. And so that kind of gets them to fly in and land there. And that kind of tells you where you would need to be set up to. You want to be down there by that uh, downwind uh, spot where they're going to come flying in. And just make sure regardless of which one that you're using or hunting for, that you give them plenty of room to sit down. And if the birds seem to be shy about landing, you might need to adjust things uh, and open up a landing hole for them. As far as the motion of the decoys, uh, I already talked about the spinning wing decoys and uh, that can help in situations where the ducks might be uh, decoy shy. Uh, or in places where they're the, you're hunting ducks in fields or divers on big water. And most experts will tell you that uh, models that have a remote controlled on off switch uh, can be really, really helpful. Um, you don't want to leave those wings flapping just on and on and on. 
but if it's something you can turn off and on, uh, that helps them think that it's the real deal. And if if it's a uh, on the water motion setup, uh, uh, there might be uh, mechanized feeders or uh, swimming decoys or jerk strings that kind of make it look like a duck is moving in the water. And those are really good on calm days when the wind's not moving the decoys very much. If you're gonna call ducks, uh, that adds a whole new dimension to the setup. So they're not just seeing a decoy, they're hearing what they think are other ducks calling. And uh, uh, most of those duck calls are mimicking mallards. So that quack, 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 uh, that kind of a, a rapid sound, that's more like a mallard. And usually they're a tube and it's kind of a, a barrel type uh, piece that goes in your mouth and it's got some reeds, one or two reeds on it and you blow on them and it kind of sounds like a funny uh, kazoo, uh, but uh, you kind of huff the air into it and uh, you want it to be kind of a deeper, uh, raspier uh, sound that's more like a, a hen mallard would make. So there's several different calls. There's a quack, there's a highball, there's a feeding chuckle, and you wanna make sure that you get realistic. If ducks are passing over your spread and they don't seem to be convinced, uh, you can throw in a comeback call, which is just a fast uh, uh, series of five quacks that are kind of descending in cadence. So quack, 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 quack. And that's the kind of thing that's saying, come back, come back. And always call at the tails of birds or when they're on the corners. So uh, you don't want to hammer them when they're coming in or if they're hovering above you uh, you can scare them. They, they realize that that's too aggressive and you'll scare them off. But uh, again, concealment is really, really important. If they can see you, they will not come in. And less is more. If the, decks, if the uh, ducks are coming in, just be quiet. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, so don't, don't uh, get call happy and think that you've got to blow on that duck call just on and on and on. You'll end up scaring them off. As far as the blinds, uh, these work really well on shorelines and in fields, and uh, you want to have it sitting low enough that it blends in. You don't want something that's a big tall thing that looks unnatural to them. And uh, there's a lot of these commercial boat blinds that's just a thing that goes on the top of the John boat that makes it look like it's part of the, the marsh or the swamp. And uh, you can make blinds from wood or other natural materials. Uh, like cattails or, or timber, or any, anything like that. Just make sure you stay low and you don't disturb anything too much that looks unnatural and make sure that it matches the color and everything of the field where you're gonna be. And you want to blend in with it. So that means you're gonna wanna wear camouflage and, and have a face mask or face paint on uh, so that they don't see, hey, there's a human down there. <clears throat> Next. All right, I'm all done. Any questions? All right, very good. It's all you, Nanette. Okay, can you see me and hear me? Okay. Um, if you have any questions, you can um, unmute yourself and we can answer them. Um, if you want a recipe card, um, we will send those to you in the mail. Um, so if we do not have your email, ad um, your mailing address, make sure you call the extension office at 606-633-2362 and we'll get your mailing address and we will mail you a copy of the Duck and Potatoes recipe card. Um, so if you have any questions, make sure you just call and ask for me or Shad and we can answer your questions and we hope that you enjoyed the presentation today. Thank you all.